All right. Good morning or good afternoon. Or I see it's 1 a.m. in Tokyo right now. <laughs> We've got some people representing uh, from over there as well. So uh, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in and happy webinar Wednesday uh, to you all. Uh, that's what it is here at Lulu anyway. And for all of you for joining us. So thanks for tuning in on this beautiful day. Um, or afternoon or, or middle of the, the early morning. Um, so today is the first in a two-part series we're doing on building your online bookstore. So as we kind of talked uh, um, on our marketing team and conceptualized what this would look like, we were talking about how to build your own bookstore online. Um, and we kind of, as we were delving into that, realized that, well, what is the point of building a bookstore if you don't have anyone to share it with? So. That kind of led us to starting with building your audience. Seemed like a good place to start. So today we're going to work on how to build your audience, and then we'll follow this up next week at the same same time with how to build your bookstore and maximize profit. So let's dive right into it. We're, we've got our sunglasses cat. This is an omen of a good webinar, so we're gonna gonna hop right in. So we'll start with the company profile. For those of you who do not know who we are or are unfamiliar with us, we are Lulu. So I always like to tell people that Lulu is an actual word. It's not just a fun mouth sound. So it's a remarkable person, object, or idea. A little bit about us is we've been, or we were founded in 2002. So we've been around for quite a while uh, by entrepreneur, authorpreneur Bob Young. He's also the co-founder of Red Hat. Um, so Bob, you know, co-founded Red Hat and then wanted to write a book about that experience. Uh, found the process very difficult, uh, a lot of gatekeepers, very expensive, very time consuming, and just felt like that wasn't it wasn't practical for the average person to, to share their story or write their book and get it out there and felt like there had to be a better way to do it. There needed to be more open source um, opportunities for people to create and publish and sell their books. And that is where Lulu came from. So we're a free to use pl publishing platform. We have printed since our you know conception in 2002, we printed over 1.1 million books and paid out over a hundred million dollars, almost a thousand, but it's million uh, in author revenue. And that just continues to grow. So um, our mission is that we're dedicated to making the world a better place, one book at a time through sustainable practices, innovative print on demand products and a commitment to excellent service. Um, and so with the sustainable practices leads me into this next slide that we are a B Corp. Love sharing this little factoid. So B Corps are for-profit companies that are certified by the nonprofit B Lab to meet rigorous standards of social and environmental performance, accountability, and transparency. Um, so there's a growing, uh, very vibrant B Corp community. Uh, now more than ever, I think it's important to, uh, you know, put your dollars where uh, where companies are going to take care and be good stewards of them and to buy from businesses that are trying to do a little bit better for the earth than just taking and making money. Um, so anyway, I just encourage all of you guys, if you're not familiar with B Corps or any B companies that may be in your area, definitely check it out. All right, let's meet the team. So I am Chelsea and I am the brand engagement manager for Lulu. Hi, I'm Anna Marie. I'm a marketing associate and I'll be monitoring chat today. Hey, I'm Lauren. I'm the social media manager. And I'm Paul. I am the team's copywriter. That is true. Correct. Y'all answer those questions appropriately. So we're off to a good start. All right. So we're going to dive in with content creation. So one of the key ways to build or attract an audience is with great content. And these days there's so many places that content can be shared and that is so fantastic, but you need one central place where it can live and where you can send that traffic. Uh, and this is where your author website comes in. So in this section, I'm going to start with the author website and talk about uh, content creation for your author website and how that can support your efforts to build your audience. So author website, like I said, this is your pillar page. This is the HQ, the headquarters for all of your content. So I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about website providers because there's so many options out there that are available. And it really depends on, you know, as I was researching this, the end of the day, it depends on what you're looking for in a website. So we do have a Lulu U video about building your author website where I go a bit more um, in depth and we talk about these platforms a bit more and sort of the highlights and capabilities. 
But I've got on this short list over here the, the usual suspects. So your WordPress, Squarespace, and Wix. So all of these are great options for you. Um, and you know it's important to remember that regardless of which one you go with, like I said, this is your home base. And next week, we're going to talk about how you'll turn this website into your bookstore um, and be able to sell directly to your readers. And so creating your author website is a great place to start when you're thinking about the, the reader journey um, that your audience is going to go on to find you, to find your content, and ultimately buy your book. Um, so if you've not thought about setting up your website, you know, as I mentioned, it's really an essential part of building a successful author brand. Um, this is where your readers will go to learn more about you, to find out about what new projects you're working on, and then, you know, even learn about your creative process and ultimately, like I said, buy your book. Um, so with WordPress, this is, again, usual suspects here, things that you're going to see pretty commonly in powering the internet as we know it. Um, so WordPress is a great option if you're starting out, but a bit of a learning curve uh, if you're unfamiliar with it. Uh, that's not a, a great reason to uh, to mark it off your list. You should definitely explore all these. We use WordPress um, at Lulu, and that kind of hosts our blog. And so, Paul, I'll, I'll let you decide if you want to comment on WordPress or not. Um, however, WordPress is a great option and a good place to start. Um, but if you kind of want more opportunities to move around or uh, customize your website, then Squarespace, Wix, and some of the newer alternatives to WordPress may be a better option for you. So for Squarespace, this is a really customizable and clean platform um, with straightforward and kind of easy to use, a lot of drag and drop features there, and they have about 70 templates to choose from. Um, so both Wix and Squarespace support blogging, which I'll get into uh, in a little bit. It's really crucial or key to kind of your content creation um, system that you'll create. <laughs> Uh, but Squarespace has a more intuitive platform for creating that blog content. So it's, again, just depends on how customizable you want to get with these. So ending this list with Wix is basically infinitely customizable, um, which can be good or bad. So I watched some tutorials ahead of this uh, webinar, and it seems like you know I, there are studies that say giving people infinite amount of choices or several choices can actually be problematic. I do think this is sort of what Wix is getting into. Uh, the ability to customize this site is infinite so you can kind of start moving things around which will cause you to move more things around and then you know you could just spend all day moving stuff around and then never really get to the part of actually having it up and running so depending on where you are and what your personality is that could sound very enticing it could be intimidating um so it can be good or bad there are about 691 templates to choose from on wix so again could be time consuming even getting to kind of the starting point but good to know there um, and another thing to note with Wix and Squarespace is they both offer free domains if you pay annually. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that can be something that can be really valuable. And what's on the second column here of this slide is what to look for in your author website. So as you're looking through these, a couple of things that I think are really valuable and that you'll definitely want to be able to check off your list before kind of committing to one is going to be a custom domain. So rather than seeing something like, you know, a word, WordPress dot lulu.com or whatever, um, you want to be able to just have lulu.com or lulu.com slash blog. So for you as an author, if you want to create this website specifically for a book or a series or, you know, use your author name, then that might be really important to you is having, you know, your name be the forefront of the domain rather than the hosting site. So if you're interested in that, then definitely you want to look and see if the provider you're using can offer you um, a custom domain. Uh, E-commerce capabilities. So can you pull in plugins? Can you sell from this website? also will be very important. And again, we'll touch on that next week in the creating your own bookstore conversation we'll have. Um, so blog hosting, again, blog uh, or blog content is sort of one of the pillars, I would say, of content creation. It's just a great avenue or a great tool for you to use to share your content, to get it out there, um, and to just kind of try your hand at a lot of different themes and variations of what kind of content you want to share. So you'll definitely want to find a provider that can host a blog and, you know, depending on what your blog looks like or what you want to pull into it, that blog interface and editing capabilities may be really important to you. The last one is social feed. So can you pull in, you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with websites that you go to and on the sidebar, it has, you know, the latest Twitter updates or kind of whatever social media you want to share. If that's important to you, you may want to check that box and make sure that whatever website provider you are going with has that capability as well. Okay, so... Up next, I'm just going to share a few author website pro tips. So I kind of gave you a short list of things you probably want to make sure your provider has. Here are a few things just to keep in mind as you are building and designing your website. 
So make sure your site is easy to navigate. So that's number one for a reason. You know, you need to think of as you're developing your web page, when your uh, readers or your audience or whomever comes across your website, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to learn more about you? Do you want them to hear about your latest projects? Do you want them to sign up to get a free download so you can get that email capture that we'll talk about in a little bit? Or do you want them to go straight to, you know, your shop or where you're selling your books? So think about that. You know, I see a ton of author websites um, from Lulu Authors and beyond and you get there and you're just distracted because they've got ads running. They've got, you know, their social feed, which can be, a, you know, a plus or a minus depending on your audience. Um, then they can have, you know, all these different blog posts that are sort of mishmashed and a hodgepodge on the homepage and you just don't know where to look and that can be a negative. So you want to make sure that your intention for the reader is really clear when they get to your website so they know exactly how to navigate and get to where you want them to go. So again, kind of going back to that author, or I'm sorry, reader journey or that customer journey that you're really curating through this website, through your social media channels, your email campaigns, uh, and your content creation. So, and the next one on here is including about me section. So if you're writing under a pen name or something like that, this can, this can look a bit different, but if you are writing um, under your regular name or your persona that you're building, you want to share about that, then an about me section is a great way for you to just kind of give people your background, um, connect with them on a more human level, and, uh, you know, just share that information there about how you got into writing if you want to. This is highly customizable, so you can share whatever information you want that you feel like may be compelling or interesting to your readers. Um, so your store and buy links are easily accessible. So again, if you do have the intent to sell on your website, make sure you're making that easy. If you want to take out all the barriers to entry from that reader getting to your website to hitting that buy or checkout button. So just make sure that there's a really clear path and you're making it easy and accessible for your books or other content and more products to be found on your website. Blog. Again, here we are with the blog. So again, as I mentioned, you want to make sure that your website um, host has blog hosting capabilities. Um, and then this is just such a great way for you to, to champion any causes that you care about, anything that you think is important with your book, teasers. And um, we'll get into that next time. Or I'm sorry, on the next slide. All right. So the next step, contact info. So again, this can look different depending where you are with your author journey, but you probably want to at least have your social handles and where people can find you outside of your website. Or again, kind of email if you have a generic email um, or people can you know, ask questions or follow up with you on any anything you may have posted on your website or whatever. You want to have some sort of communication and that can just be social media, but it's nice to just have that out there for your readers. Uh, and then last but definitely not least is email capture. So at this point in time in the world and history, uh, we've probably all been to websites where kind of immediately when you land on a page, it's popping up with some kind of email capture or they're, they're going to give you something if you give your email. So that can be great. And, you know, later in this presentation, we're going to talk about why email is so valuable. But you definitely, definitely want to have some mechanism on your author website to capture email for those who are willing to share that information and join your email list. All right, so next up, we're going to get into content ideas. So this is a long but also kind of short and not exhaustive list of some, some kind of tips to get you started with content. But really, the, the important thing about content is to be consistent with it, but also, you know, consistent with your posting, but also be experimental. So play around. Like I mentioned in the beginning, there's so many ways to share content, so many ways to get it out there, whether that's podcast, um, you know, Podcasts, blogs, video, social live videos, readings, and things like this. So um, I'll run down these, but there's just so many options that are available. This can be highly customized based on your genre or topic of interest. So, for example, you know, if your book is about professional development, you may consider posting a blog or article um, for the best conferences for professional development each year or a recap of your experiences at the ones you've been to. Um, but if you are a fiction author or maybe your book is like a psychological thriller or something like that, then maybe some of your content would be the best true crime podcast you've come across or listened to in your research um, for creating your book. So the key here is to find what resonates with your audience and continue to offer it in unique and interesting ways. Um, another thing to think about as you're kind of looking over this list is content creation can be a really great way for you to connect with other communities or authors or organizations that you're interested in and that you think will have some overlap with your audience. Um, you know, sharing their content or sharing links to a website or a post that you found really helpful can be a nice way to kind of catch their eye and then start a dialogue with those organizations or other authors that you want to connect with. 
So you can see, I, I uh, as I was looking through some research, I feel like these were some of the top uh, top ideas to kind of get you started. But I've also heard of authors that, you know, just anytime they have an idea or a thought for an article or a post or anything, they just write it down, keep a list of it. So anytime, you know, the well is dry or you're not able to really think of content that comes off top of mind or any kind of current events that are inspiring you to create, then you can kind of go back to this master list that you have and pull from that. Um, you know, another thing that is important to uh, to remember here uh, is that, you know, obviously you'll have a lot of platforms working in concert with each other, but a little pro tip would be to jot down a few themes that you feel describe you and your author brand and use those to help create your content. So, you know, if you feel like your author brand is really funny and irreverent, or, you know, maybe it's more informative and professional, but either way, developing how you want your brand to be defined can be really helpful in the content creation process. And I would say this is even, uh, well, potentially more important for nonfiction authors because you can kind of set out the parameters for what you want people to come to you for, what information they're getting from you, and kind of be the go-to and the expert for those topics or themes. So again, I'm not, I trust all of you can, can read so I will not read out this whole entire list, but you can see it really runs the gamut of what kind of content that you can create and uh, and again, what where you can share it. All right, so speaking of sharing, sharing is caring. So you have all these great content ideas. You're posting about your workspace. You're posting about your pets and what they're doing. You're posting about you know your writing process and how you came across the character arc we're building. Um, you're posting about organizations that mean something to you. So again, runs the gamut of what you can create, but the uh, important thing is when you think about creating this content, where are you going to share it? So your author website is obviously, as I mentioned multiple times, the home base. So you always have the, the opportunity to post your content to your website, and that's a great idea. Um, but as we'll get into uh, next, email. You can share this information through email. So capturing these emails as people come to your website is a great way to stay in touch with them, You know, share about upcoming projects you have or a backlist that you've created, um, share about events that you're going to. I mean, nowadays they're, they're probably virtual, but you can kind of overlap your online efforts with some of your in-person efforts through things like email and posting on your website. Um, again, social media is obviously great for that too. Um, and then Medium, I put Medium here as really a catch-all, but if you feel that your audience is on Quora or Reddit or whatever other corners of the web your, your research leads you to, um, then post there too. You know, this is, again, not exhaustive and so customizable, depending on where you are in your author journey and what your goals are, um, kind of to get to that next level of it. So uh, last thing I'll leave you guys with here are a little bit of a uh, few pro tips for your content. So consistency is key. Um, but, you know, consistency doesn't mean conformity. So, you know, you want to be able to post regularly. You want to have fresh content, but you don't have to be doing the same thing all the time. Um, so you don't always have to be writing blog posts. If you want to do video content, you can do that. If you want to experiment with some live social content um, or, you know, any other any other kind of interesting ways that you feel that you can connect with your audience, do that. Go there and just see if it works. Um, so consistency is really important. I was reading an article about a guy who was working on his author newsletter and he was just saying that he kind of went a couple months without sending it out, which can be a negative. I mean, that's enough time for people to forget about you or move on to the next thing or lose interest in your project. So once you start creating content, come up with a calendar that's going to be, um, you know, achievable for you and something that you're going to be able to stick with. So once you have that down, Post, review, and repeat. So monitor these. See where, like, where are you getting the most clicks on your website? Uh, what social media posts are performing well? What email sends are getting the highest open rates? So you know, even though creating this content um, should be consistent, you also need to plan for a time to review what you're doing, maybe on like a weekly or monthly basis, and see. Oh yeah, you know, when I wrote about um, how I overcome writer's block, that post got a lot of traction. It got a lot of traffic, a lot of clicks. So I'm going to write more about my uh, my methods and how I am working behind the scenes. Um, you know, so kind of looking at what's really resonating with your audience, then repeating it or um, making variations of that content is always a good idea if you're getting the results that you're looking for. And then the last one, I've alluded to this already, but get creative and don't be afraid to try new things. So if you feel like your blog content is just okay, um, then, you know, maybe changing the frequency or, you know, again, changing the content, adding some video elements in there. 
um, you know, just mixing it up and, and using all these tools that are available that are available to you to create the landscape and the picture that you want your brand to be. So don't be afraid to try new things. I know that the internet, most things live forever, but you can also delete a lot of stuff. And especially when you're just starting out, it'll take you a while to sort of play around before you really hit that sweet spot of what your readers and your audience are looking for um, and the content they want from you. So again, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We're all learning. Uh, and that'll take me to the end of my section. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul so we can talk about building out that email following that I mentioned. Hey, Chelsea. Thanks for uh, giving us some great information about author websites and blogging. I always like to hear people plugging blogging since that's most of what I do with my day. <laughs> um, so the, the second thing that we want to really get into is obviously building an email following. And I would say of all of the things you do um, in the course of author or uh, audience building, this is going to be not only one of the most important, but one of the more effective. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Can we slip to that next slide? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. There we go. So first off, everyone uses email. Um, it's pervasive. It's in our phones. It's on our computers. I would be very surprised if you work at a computer all day and you don't constantly have a tab with your email open or you know the Outlook app running on your uh, desktop constantly. Same thing with your phones. It's one of those things that we always have notifications on, I think most of us anyway. Um, so we're just constantly seeing emails come in. It's a great way to get in front of people um, and it's a way that you can be very, very sure everyone is using. I think the second and most interesting part about email that I I didn't even really know this until I started digging into this and talking to our email expert here at Lulu, but it's very cheap and it's very effective. Um, I just threw up one little stat there of the $38 earned for every dollar spent. That's an average um, and it is across you know some brand names and stuff like that. So it's probably not going to be quite as high for you know an author who's got a, just a few books to sell. But the point is the cost to send emails is so low that you don't actually have to make all that many sales, you know, based on your email list for it to be worthwhile. Um, and we'll get into the, the costs and some of those things a little bit, uh, a couple of slides later, but it's just important to point out and to, to really know that it, it may seem a little imposing to kind of get into being an email marketer for, for your book, but the benefit of doing that and the return potential is so high that there's just no reason not to. Um, third reason, and I, this is one I really like, and I think, if you kind of keep an eye on your inbox and you get a, a variety of emails from a variety of sources, you can really see this one is the, the personal touch. And I say this, it goes more, uh, it goes beyond that seeing your name in the first line, you know, seeing that someone captured your name when you gave them your email and then just plugged it in there. Um, it, it's so much more than that. It's understanding what people who give you your email to follow you want. Um, there's sort of a, if, if you're an author, for example, and you write nonfiction books about climate change and someone joins your email list, you can kind of assume a lot of things about them right from that. The information they give you by signing up to an email list for someone who writes about climate change is going to let you know that they're interested in the climate. They're interested in maybe green energy initiative, things like that. So you can really tunnel in on some topics that are going to be important and personal to these, these uh, recipients of these emails. And that's a great way to build, you know, strong subject lines. So, you know, that subject line is the first thing you see when you get a notification about a new email. That's how you hook them. You know, if you wrote an email, again, on the climate change uh, example that said, you know, uh, gas, gas automobiles are garbage, eh, maybe you're not going to click on it. But if you wrote uh, electric automobiles are more cost effective than ever, could be the exact same piece of content, but that's a subject line that's a little bit more appealing. So those sorts of things that allow you to personalize and really speak to your audience directly. Um, and then the last one, and it kind of ties into the personal, is that email equals interest. So it takes very little effort for someone to click the like button or the follow button on a social media um, site. You know, I do it all the time. I have to go through and you know, clean out my list because I will just like so many things that I get bombarded and then I'm like, why am I following all of the people that sell sneakers? I have plenty of sneakers. So, you know, you're always constantly cleaning up your social media list because it's so easy to follow so many different things. But email, you physically have to type in your email address into a little box and click enter. And then a lot of times check a box that says I'm not a robot and click the photos in those nine photo panels that contain, you know, taxis or streetlights 
And then probably also go to your email, open an email that says, hey, do you want to be part of this list? And click, yes, I do want to be part of this list. That shows so much interest from someone. It takes an effort on their part. And so that's saying to you as the person who you know is asking for these people to subscribe, that this person really wants to hear what you have to say. So that display of interest is really important because again, it lets you personalize and know that this person wants to hear what you have to offer. Um, and one last little pro tip before we move on to the next slide. I do think, even though I kind of made a little bit of fun of the idea of putting the, you know, hi Paul at the beginning of every email when you capture their name, it is really worthwhile when you create an email capture form to capture their name. So all you have to do is have one box that says name, another box that says email, and then you subscribe. Even if the emails don't use their name, it's information that you have. And if there is a, you know, a specific kind of email that maybe really lends itself to that, you've got it available. So it's always good to have that on hand. All right, thank you, Chelsea. Um, so as I just mentioned, the most important thing to get your email marketing started is to capture some emails. Um, and I said, I'm gonna use the word capture a bunch and I kind of hate it here because it sounds a little nefarious. It's like we're pirates and we're, we're stealing something from them. Um, it's not nefarious at all. It's a very just, it's just the term that gets used in the industry. So I'm gonna keep using it because it's what's out there, but I, I'm just gonna put that little disclaimer out there that I'm not a huge fan of that term. So um, as Chelsea said, you wanna build yourself an author website and she listed some really great platforms, WordPress, Wix, Squarespace, Shopify, there's a bunch of them. Um, whatever you pick is gonna give you either a built-in option for capturing emails or plugins that will let you capture emails for whatever service you use. Um, and we'll get into some services a little bit later when I talk about some pricing and stuff like that. But for now, we're gonna look at some of the different ways that you can capture emails. So if you go to any website that sells products, you're gonna find an email capture form somewhere. Um, a lot of times that form lives in the footer and it's just a little section that says, you know, join our mailing list, subscribe for news, you know, find out when sales happen, whatever kind of hook the, the company wants to use to get you to drop your email in there. Um, those are forms. Uh, bloggers will often put those in their sidebar as well. Um, if you go to blog.lulu.com, which I encourage you all to do, there's a sidebar form on every article where you can give your email address and every time I publish an article, you'll get a weekly email that says, you know, this article was published this week, which you should all go do, please, like now. <laughs> <laughs> um, floating boxes are like a banner, um, and I, you're probably very familiar with banners because lots of sites have uh, COVID-19 banners warning you about closures or restricted hours or uh, shipping delays, things like that. Some sites will use banners like that for email capture as well. So you'll scroll down a page and that banner will kind of be sticky to the top or the bottom and follow you as you go up or down the page. Um, those, those are popular. They serve very similar functions to your forms. Um, I don't like them as much, but again, it kind of, you want to feel out what you, uh, what you think is going to work best. Um, so that's just one option you have out there. One I do really like are the pop-up and slide-in forms. So these are ones that are based on an action that your user takes. And sometimes that action is just being on your page. You might open a tab um, for you know an article you're interested in and you start reading and as you scroll a pop-up takes over and makes you look at it or it slides in from the side so it's less obtrusive to what you're reading these things are annoying a lot of us have uh, browsers that will block them automatically and to be fair slide ins and some light box pop-ups will actually get around those so it's even trickier but what you really have to know is they're effective they are so so effective so while they may seem annoying and you may kind of feel bad about annoying people. It's important to remember that the way these are built with cookies in browsers, and I don't want to get into too much of the technical stuff, but the way that they're built, if someone X's out of it, they're not going to keep seeing it every time they go to your page. Or if they do, there's a setting you need to adjust. But most uh, site building tools and uh, email capture uh, uh, pre-formatted pre forms will default to not um, repeating themselves, usually on like a 30 or 90 day cadence. So like, if they come to your site, they close out of that pop-up, they won't see it again for 90 days. And so that's to avoid that annoyance. Um, and so, so as, as these have become more sophisticated, they've also become much more effective. Pop-ups work. So I do encourage you, um, if you're really trying to build out your email list, you have to have a form, so you have to have it in your footer or your sidebar or somewhere like that, but you should also have a pop-up. Um, and for authors, 
a really, really great way to sweeten the deal with that is making an offer. So instead of just saying sign up for emails to you know get my latest blog posts or blah blah blah, put a little thing in there that says sign up for emails and get a free ebook, uh, get the first chapter of my next book, my upcoming book, and send them a free ebook when they sign up. It can be an EPUB that just has you know the first chapter, no problem. It's easy to create EPUBs. It's easy. It's a very small file. You just ship it along in whatever automated process you have that sends them an email. Um, it's a great way to show them a little bit of your work, entice them to sign up. Um, and it's content you've already created, so you don't have to do as much work to build it. And then the final uh, capture form, or the, um, the final form of capture, a little bit of a tongue twister there, is a landing page. Um, any email service provider, ESP, that you use is going to give you the option to build an, a landing page to capture emails. Um, also, most of the site building tools that Chelsea mentioned will offer that as well. You just, it's, it's just a URL. It's going to be, you know, mysite.com slash uh, email capture or sign up or something like that. And that landing page is basically just going to have a headline that says, you know, sign up for emails, a little bit of copy underneath it that says, here's why you should do this. And then that capture form. It's just important so that you can direct people to it. So it's better than saying, go to my website, scroll to the bottom, put it in the footer. It, it, it may seem like that one extra step of scroll to the bottom to get to the footer to sign up is kind of inconsequential, but it's really, really helpful to have that direct link to signing up. Um, so that's worth doing and it's worth having available. And then last thing before we move on is laws. So be very, very conscious of some of the laws that have come out in the last few years. And I'm talking GDPR, CAN spam, CCPA, um, CCPA is the most recent one in America. That's the California Consumer Protection Act. Basically, uh, states and countries are getting much more conscious of uh, users' rights to privacy and their data. So you just want to be clear that you're capturing the data for the purposes of uh, marketing to them, sharing information with them. Um, Again, every site building tool that you use is going to prompt you to put one of those little banners. I'm sure you've seen these around the web where this little banner comes up and says, this site uses cookies, please accept, or here's how to you know, adjust those settings. Just make sure you've got that turned on and you're good. And make sure that every single email you send has an unsubscribe button in the footer of the email. Every single one. Whatever service you're using to send emails is going to default to including that anyway, but don't get rid of it. I'm sure. All of us has had that experience with a brand that makes it hard to unsubscribe from emails, and it is the worst. So don't be that person. Don't make it hard for them to un unsubscribe. Don't think that by hiding it, you're like preventing unsubscribes because you're just annoying this person. Um, and realistically, you don't want to send emails to people who don't want emails. So even more reason to let them unsubscribe. You know, if they don't like what they're getting, you want to know that. That's information. If you see a bunch of people unsubscribe after you sent a, an email, look at that email and say, why? Maybe there was something you did in that that didn't work. Um, so yeah, just be, be conscious of the laws. You're probably not going to run afoul of anything, but be aware. All right. We can, oh, there we go. Thank you. So now that you've got uh, some, some tools on your site to capture emails, you need to start developing that list. Um, so first thing you want to do is get out there to your network. And I'm talking friends, family, uh, coworkers, uh, other authors that you are, you work with, you know, if you're a part of a writing group or if you uh, go to, you know, your local bookstores, which I know it's kind of hard to go to your local bookstores, but you know, anyone you might know from those circles, leverage those folks and say, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I've got my books. I want to start sending some blog posts out. I want to share what I'm doing with people. Would you sign up for an email? Um, that's a great way to get started and to get some some good honest feedback. So getting you know your friends to say you know hey your emails look good or here's something you know this image isn't loading right blah 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 all of that little bits of information you can get out there. That's a great way to get started on it. Once you've started to build up a base and you start kind of getting comfortable with sending emails, um, social ads. And I'm going to let Lauren get a little bit more into social media stuff because I don't know much about it at all. But I do know that you can run advertisements on social media, target them at specific people, such as people that like the genre you write in or people that are interested in authors, whatever. Again, out of my realm. But target those folks, send them ads that are well-crafted, 
um, and that prompt them to click that ad and go to that landing page we were just talking about, the one where you sign up. It's on your site. If they're interested, they'll click around and get some other information, but you just want to send them there specifically. Please sign up for my emails. Um, next up, look for opportunities with <clears throat> excuse me, other authors, um, specifically authors that have blogs. You know, If you've got an author friend that runs a blog, just be like, hey, you know, I've got a blog too. Do you want to trade posts? Trading posts, guest posts are great because now you're building a relationship with that author. You're building a relationship with their audience. They get to build a relationship with your audience. And everyone that you get to click over to your content, there's a chance they're going to sign up because you've got the form in your footer or sidebar. You've got that pop-up or slide in. You're just exposing more people to your content. Um, and your publisher. You know, Lulu runs a blog. Maybe you've got some really great insight into designing a book with a kind of writing software that we haven't covered yet. Contact us. Maybe we'll give you a guest blog spot. Um, or whoever your publisher is, you know, if you work with a more traditional publisher, talk to them about opportunities to promote your sub subscriber list. Lots of publishers today don't really do a lot of work for their authors, so any little bit you can get from them is great. Um, and be aware, of course, companies like Lulu that are DIY self-publishing, we really don't do anything for you besides providing the service. You're all on your own with your marketing. So think about ways that you can try and leverage the relationship you've already built with us by publishing with us to you know, get a little bit of help. Um, you know, if you've got a really beautiful looking book, maybe tag us in a social post and see if we'll share it. Lots of options like that. Um, again, we talked about having a your website, your blog, your book landing page. Basically, make sure your subscriber form is everywhere. Anytime someone clicks on something of yours on the web, there should be an option for them to subscribe somewhere on that page. Um, the number five is one of my favorites. Put your landing page URL, that uh, that subscriber page that we just talked about, on a business card. And I think business cards are a little outmoded, but you still, most of us still have them. And once we, you know, get this pandemic thing under control and we start going back to conferences and stuff like that, you're going to be handing them out, and you just want to have it there. You want to have it available so that when they go to your site, they've got a way to sign up. If you're really, really trying to build your uh, subscriber list out and that's like a huge focus for you, you might even create a unique business card that is just about signing up for emails. Really lay out the benefits of doing it, what you're going to send them, and then just have that uh, URL as the, the one call to action on the card. <clears throat> and finally, make sure it's in your book. If it's in an ebook, you can make it a live link and they can click over to that landing page to sign up. If it's in your print book, just put it in there somewhere, you know, on your your about the author page or your copyright page, anywhere you can, you know, you be the judge because it's your book, but put it in there somewhere. It gives people an opportunity to connect with you. And, you know, honestly, if they loved your book, they're going to sign up. I mean, all of my favorite authors, I get their newsletters because I want to know when they write another book. So you don't make it hard for people to do that. And we can hit that next slide. Here we go. All right. Types of emails. So you've got a list of people that are growing. Um, it's grown beyond your friends and your mom. You've got some, some people you don't know on there that you've captured from social media or that have you know, come across your, uh, your site because your blog has great SEO and it's coming up in organic searches and they're seeing it and they're signing up, they're liking what they see. What are you going to send them? So first off, promotional emails. Um, these are generally one-off emails. You're going to do it a bunch in the lead up to a release or periodically to drive sales in your backlist. So if you've got, say, three books out and you're working on book number four, it's in you know post-production, you're, you're proofing it, you're designing that interior, you're getting your cover proof set up, but you've got like six to eight weeks until it's going to come out, maybe even a little longer, maybe like 12 weeks until it's coming out, great time to run a little ad and promote your backlist and promote it in, you know, hey, got a new book coming out shortly, but here's what I've written already. Check this stuff out. Who knows? You've got to keep pushing your backlist, and it's great to do periodically. The big thing with promotional emails is not to spam them. Space them out. Um, once a month is like almost pushing it. And I'm not the, the be-all, end-all of that. So you know, look around on the uh, internet to, for some other advice on that one. But really think about how you can promote your stuff without coming off as spammy. And it can be a little tricky, but if you do it well and you're careful with it, it can also be a really great driver of some interactions and some sales. Um, second is lead nurturing, and this is a very much industry term. Um, if you, you read this little blurb here, you see that word automation, which is, again, more jargon. But basically what you want to do is when someone signs up for an email, 
you want an automated set of pre-built emails, you've written these, you've designed them, you've already added everything into it, to send off on a schedule. Um, so what will happen is they, they put their email address in that capture form, they confirm they want to be signed up, they've gone through the process of checking that little I'm not a robot box, and they've got that email subscriber uh, verification, they've clicked the button in, and they're all signed up. Maybe the next day, 24 hours after that, they get an email from you that says, hey, welcome to my list, friend. Thank you for joining. Here's what you can expect from me. Here's a link to you know my most recent book. Here's a link to a blog post I think you're going to love. Then the, a week after that, or five days, whatever, you pick the cadence, um, they get another email that says, hey, just uh, checking in. I'm really glad you signed up for emails. Here's one more look at something really awesome I did, or here's something I think you might really like. So I wouldn't go beyond maybe three or four emails in this series. It depends on how much content you have on your site. It could even just be the one email, honestly. It could just be that first uh, you know, welcome email. But these are things that are designed to, one, show you appreciate them signing up, and two, kind of give them a little introduction to what you've got to offer. Um, these are also things that once you've captured their email and they're on your list, you might shoot those off based on actions they take on your site, such as buying a book. If they bought your book, um, let's say they bought the second book in a series, you maybe pair off an email that comes a day after that purchase that says, you know, hey, I see you bought the second book, maybe you maybe get the first one so you know what's going on, something like that. Um, the, you're not going to send a lot of these, especially as an author who maybe doesn't have a huge mailing list that you're trying to really um, manicure all the time. You just kind of want to make sure you're doing that welcome series. That is the most important lead nurturing automated series that you're going to want to do. Um, the third point is newsletters. These are the basic, and the newsletter is kind of a dirty word in email, and we're getting away from that one. They're just, they're just emails. They're, they're emails you send to people. These are going to be the most common ones. Um, you probably want to do something like weekly or maybe twice a month. It's going to depend on how often you blog, how much content you're creating, what kind of content you're creating. Um, but this is the one that you send. That This is the reason they signed up, is to get this newsletter. So make it good. Uh, put a great graphic for a headline, make sure it targets their interests based on, you know, what you do and why you think they signed up. Um, and make sure, you know, it's free of spelling errors, got at least one, if not more links to somewhere on your site. Ideally, you're always going to have a block somewhere in it that is about your most recent book that you're promoting. Um, so that's always important to have in there. And then always have your social links somewhere, you know, right above or below the footer somewhere in the bottom. And then the last one is a survey. So these can be a lot of fun. You know, if you just had a book come out, you, you wait a few weeks and you maybe send a survey out to your followers and be like, hey, did you buy my new book? If you did, did you like this, that, or the other thing about it? One, if they didn't buy it and they get the survey, they might go buy it. And so make sure there's a link to the book in there. And two, it gives you some feedback, which is always useful. You're, you're leveraging these people that have showed interest in you to learn how to do it better. And the next slide. Last thing we're going to look at real quick. These are three of the uh, best kind of starter email service providers. Um, low cost. MailChimp is a really great one to start with because they allow for up to 2,000 users and 12,000 emails, I believe, uh, uh, per year, 12,000 per year, which is a ton. Um, but all three of these offer a lot of great templates. They offer landing page and capture forms. Um, they're very reasonably priced. And they're going to give you so much automated a, in terms of building the emails, um, help and support that, you know, I, a lot of what I just said might sound like a ton of work, but honestly, you could sign up for MailChimp, spend a Saturday, just focus in on learning it and building out some email forms and you're, you're done. You're ready to go. Um, so these are my three top picks. You can also just Google, you know, best, cheap or free uh email service providers. I almost guarantee you're going to see MailChimp near the top of that list a bunch, but give them a try, play with them. The other important thing to note is they all offer you the opportunity to export and keep your list. So if you decide to move to a different one, just grab the list that you've created with them and import it with the new one. All right. And I think that's all I've got for some uh, email. Let's uh, pass it over to Lauren to talk about social media and cool cats. Cool cat. Sorry about that. That's uh, your actual cat, IRL, in real life. In fact, my actual cat. Her actual sunglasses on. That's great. It's the first <laughs> and last time she wore them. <laughs> That's okay. 
Um, anyway, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I wanted to say something real quick before we get into social media that is applicable to everything that we've talked about here. Um, and that is uh, whether we're talking about a website, a blog, email subscription, social media, whatever the case may be, trust your instincts. At this point, just in the way that the world works, we are all familiar with interacting these interacting with these different forms of media from a consumer perspective, even if we're not used to using them professionally. So you've had these tricks and these tools and these tips used on you before. So think about what has worked in or in getting you. Think about what's made you sign up for an email mailing list before, or what's made you follow somebody on social media, or made you click on a blog post for somebody that you didn't know, but the blog sounded interesting. You already know a lot of the stuff that you need to build these different platforms out, even if you don't really realize it yet. So think about what's worked for you. Think about what hasn't worked for you too. That's always a really important thing. Think about the last time that you deleted an email because you were like, oh, I hate that this guy always writes his subject lines in all lowercase letters. It's so annoying. I literally unsubscribed from somebody recently because I was tired of seeing the, the word I in lowercase in subject lines and professional emails. Like, think about things like that. You got, you've got a lot of this experience already from the consumer spec, uh, perspective. So now just think about how to flip it around. So now let's talk about social media specifically. Um, so I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, social media being a fickle monster. It, it can be at the best of times. Um, and especially when you are trying to, yeah, Diana, exactly like E.E. E. Cummings. Um, especially when you're trying to grow an audience of followers, social media can be a process, definitely for sure. Um, and I'm sure that if you were to go into Google right now and search how to get followers, you would see so many different results come up and so many different tips for how to grow your fan base, both in organic methods and in easy methods. Um, so I'm going to just say right off the bat here, uh, there is no easy way to grow your audience on social media. Um, and if anybody is ever trying to get you to buy into, and I mean literally buy into, a pay for followers or follow for follow scheme or something like that, don't do it. It's not worth the cost. It's not worth your time. And most importantly, it's not going to give you anything. Your follow, your followers, your fan base, your audience, whatever it is, you want an engaged audience. And if you have a hundred followers, but 75% of them actually engage with you, that's way better than having a thousand followers where only 5% of them engage with you. So, you know, definitely, I didn't actually check the math on that. So I'm assuming that's less than 5% of a thousand is less than 75, but you know what I meant. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind when you're working on building your followers. Uh, there is no, there is no shortcut. There is no easy way. And if anybody tries to offer you one, Take a good look at what it is that they're trying to offer you because chances are it's a scam and absolutely not worth it. So that being said, if there isn't an easy way to get followers, what's the hard way? I don't want to call it the hard way because that's all relative. So let's call it instead the right way. What's the right way to organically find an engaged audience of followers? Uh, so we are going to take a look at five steps that you can take to grow your audience on any social media platform. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, step one, we're going to prepare your social pages for followers. Um, you want to make sure that you are putting your best foot forward on your professional social pages, which does not mean that your social media has to be professional. You have a better idea than I do of what is an appropriate tone for your target audience, but you don't have to be, you know, this, this uber professional no personality profile. Nobody wants to follow that unless that's very specifically the audience that you're trying to target. Go ahead and be yourself and have personality. Just keep it slightly more professional than you might keep your personal accounts for sure. Uh, you also, you know, you definitely want your profile to imply that you are a legitimate human being, not a bot. So that's important. Um, and that you are knowledgeable and engaged in the community or communities of your choice. Uh, so here are 
a couple of tips for how to make your profiles look legit. Um, first of all, you're going to want to make sure that you have a profile picture and where relevant a cover photo. It doesn't have to be a professional headshot, but do try to find a high quality or at least somewhat decent picture of you. Um, these days, even if you don't have a smartphone that can take a good picture of you, you have to know somebody that does. So, you know, get a quick candid. I I'm a big fan of uh, candid shots over selfies. You can always tell when somebody took a selfie and made it their profile picture. But, you know, you know the tone that you're going for better than I do. So fit what, pick what feels right. Pick what feels like it fits right for your audience. Sorry. Um, Another thing that you can do is that every social platform lets you customize your profile with a little bit uh, about me bio. Make sure that you use that. Don't leave it blank. Don't waste the space. Uh, definitely go for it. Go ahead and use that. I honestly have followed multiple people on Twitter or Instagram that I've never met before. I have no connection to, but just because their bio made me laugh or because their bio had some reference in it that I was like, ah, I get that reference. That's my kind of content. I want to see what else this person's talking about, you know, stuff like that. It's worth putting a little bit of effort in. You've got a couple of sentences there, make them count. Um, and then you also want to make sure that your page looks like it exists, that it's an active page before you start pushing for followers. Uh, and you're going to do that by sharing some content already on your page. Some of you will be using pre-existing personal profiles as your social media pages, which is fine. You totally can do that. Um, but if you're planning to start a separate author or business profile, make sure it looks like it's actually in use. Share some content, comment on or share posts from other people. Make sure that you follow a few people. It looks super suspicious if you see a profile that says like 100 followers following two people, unless that person is like Beyonce. You can get away with it. You can. I hope Beyonce is on this webinar right now. I hope so too. Beyonce, if you are, give You're us doing great. A, a nod. Um, okay. So what kind of content you might be asking? You know, it's all well and good to say share content on social media, but what kind of content? Uh, the short answer is relevant. The long answer is too long to fit in this webinar. Um, Chelsea's already covered some great content ideas. Paul also covered some great content ideas for things to share on your website, your blog, or in your newsletter. Uh, and with some tweaking, that content is all perfect fits for different social media platforms too. Um, you're definitely gonna wanna share stuff that's going to be of interest to the followers that you want to follow you. So, you know, if you're, if you're a uh, aspiring teen fiction young adult author and you start posting content about a science article that you read about tectonic plate shift. Like, you know, I'm not going to look at your page and be like, oh, look at this YA author. I'm going to look at it and be like, oh, this is interesting, but not relevant to me. And I'm probably not going to follow it. So make sure that your content fits in with the audience that you are trying to reach. Um, I've done a couple of blog posts on the Lulu blog that go into further ideas with content and ways to share um, relevant and con uh, interesting content on your different social media platforms. So instead of talking more about it now, you can always go check out the blog and find more content there. Uh, so let's go ahead to the next slide. Step two, uh, get in the habit of being active on social media regularly. Uh, so many of us that use social media casually or personally are incidental users. You know, you're going to check Facebook on your phone while you're standing in a checkout line, scrolling through Twitter during commercial breaks, whatever. Uh, but you don't usually carve out time in your day to intentionally use social media. However, if you are actively making an effort to grow your platform and to grow your audience, you should be doing just that. It doesn't have to be a lot of time out of your day. You know, you don't have to commit a big amount of time to social media every day. Take 15 minutes every morning and 15 minutes every evening, or take 30 minutes every other day, or even just an hour every Sunday, you know, whatever works for you and for your schedule, find a way to carve out some intentional social media time during your week. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what you should be doing with that time in a little bit. Uh, while you're carving out that time, while you're figuring out what schedule works for you, you might also want to look into scheduling your content and posts in advance. Uh, most of the platforms these days have the options for you to natively schedule your posts in advance. So you can go on Twitter, you can create some 
drafts of tweets and schedule them to go out at different times during the week and stuff like that. Um, so if that if that's an option that sounds appealing to you, that way you can just you know take that that one hour on Sunday morning that you've set aside for social media and schedule all your posts out for the week, and then you don't have to worry about doing it live when you're busy during the week doing other things. Um, there are also tools and platforms that'll help you corral all your social media platforms in one place and schedule all your posts across multiple platforms and interact with any engagements that you get in response to that. Um, those tools can be incredibly useful, but they also generally do have a monthly subscription cost to them. So it depends on your budget and how useful you think that is going to be. Um, but check out platforms like Hootsuite, Sprout Social, and different options like that, if that sounds interesting to you. Uh, step three, engage with other users in your community. This sounds like a given, but it is also the most important step. Now that your profiles are set up and you're in the habit of regularly spending some time on social media, start bringing in that audience. And the best way to get an audience to come to you is to go to them first. Um, so most of you, if not all of you, are publishing into a pre-existing community. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Doesn't matter if you are trying to reach poetry fans or black and white photographers, travel enthusiasts, women in STEM, women in politics, a fandom, pet owners, a religious group, foodies, travel, I, did I say travel enthusiasts already? I think I did. Doesn't matter, I could do this all day. There are thousands of audiences out there that are interested in reading books in specific genres and those audiences already exist. You don't have to create them from scratch, you just have to find them. So once you've found them, get involved in that, in that community. Participate with the people in the community. Follow other authors that are there or community leaders, if there are people that are big voices in whatever community it is. Follow them, engage with their posts, whatever platform you choose to work on. If it's Instagram, comment on their pictures. If it's Twitter, retweet and comment on whatever they tweeted. You know, get, get involved, get engaged start talking. Even if the big people that you're talking to don't wind up engaging with you, other people that follow them will start to notice you. And especially if what you're saying is relevant, on topic, and interesting. The one thing that you don't want to do with these communities is spam them with the fact that you're a published author and you want them to buy your book. They won't care. You want them to get engaged with you first and then they will care. Don't start by just dropping links to your book in there. Then you're just going to get blocked. Nobody wants that. Another thing to keep an eye on is hashtags. If there are applicable hashtags in your community. Um, for example, every year in the teen fiction publishing community, they come up with a hashtag for debut authors that are being published that year. Any new author publishing that year can use that hashtag when talking about their book. Uh, so this year, the hashtag is Roaring Twenties Debut. I follow the hashtag Roaring Twenties Debut, even though I don't follow all of the authors that are publishing this year. So anytime that somebody uses that hashtag, I see that tweet, even if I'm not following that author. And it has worked. I have followed new authors and added new books to my Goodreads list and to my to buy list because of that. So check it out. See what your community is using. If they're using hashtags, if they're into that, that is a free promotional opportunity that is worth checking out for sure. Um, also, if you are starting to get followers, if you're seeing people come through, make sure that you check them out. You know, you don't have to follow back every single person that follows you. You don't have to immediately go check on every single person that follows you. But if you have some time, if you have some in your carved out social media time, you have a couple minutes, take a look at who's followed you recently and just take a quick peek at their profile and see if they might be somebody that's worth following back. Best case scenario, broadens your reach in the community a little bit, and worst case scenario, you unfollow them when you find out that they're boring or not relevant to the audience that you're trying to build. And not for nothing, but this is why that author bio or the little about me in your profile is so important and worth putting some effort into. I know we're running out of time. I'm gonna blow through these last two steps real quick, I promise. Go ahead, thank you, Chelsea. Um, all right. Step four, keep sending new potential followers to your pages. You've put all this work into the social pages. It is time to show them off. Your social media should be included in all of your promotion, all of it. It should never be hard to find you on social media. How do you do that? I'm gonna run through a list really fast. 
first of all, your username should be something easy to remember. It should be your name, preferably, or something close to your name, your business name, your company name, whatever. Um, and it should also be the same on all of your social media platforms. You should use the same handle on whatever platform you are across the board. It makes it easier to promote it. It makes it easier for people to remember it. But if for whatever reason you've chosen to make your username not your author name, make sure that your author name, if you're writing under a pen name, that's fine, whatever it is, make sure that your author name and or your book title are mentioned in your account profile somewhere. So that way, if somebody Googles, like if you, if you Google the title of your book, your social media should come up. And it will if your, if your title is in your bio somewhere or mentioned somewhere in your social accounts. Um, if you're handing out anything at events, if you're handing out flyers or bookmarks or stickers or anything like that at any kind of event that you go to, your social media should be on there. That's why it's useful to use the same handle on every platform because then you only have to put it once instead of six different social handles. If you're writing your about the author for your book, you want to include your social handles in there. Your website, your newsletter, your email signature, and any other public facing communication should have direct links to all of your active social media pages. And if you're using a separate social account for your business, you should have them linked from your personal account too. You don't have to link them the other way around. If you want to keep your personal account separate from your business account, you don't have to give people access to your personal account from your business account. But if you have friends that follow you personally, encourage them to follow your business profile as well. Like I said, it should never be hard for somebody that is interesting, interested in finding you on social media to find you. Last but not least, step five, maintain your pages. You've put all this work in, you've polished your profiles, you've created and shared interesting content, engaging content, you've built up your follower base. Now don't waste it. Paul was talking earlier about using uh, paid ads and social campaigns. This is when you're gonna do that. You wanna do that when your profile is at its best. You don't wanna start running ads at the beginning when you're still building up your profile. You want it to be in good shape before you go ahead and start running different ad campaigns if you are gonna do that at all. Um, if you are gonna run ad campaigns, try to focus your efforts on specific campaigns, not just broad general campaigns. Uh, you know, if you wanna do just a new follower campaign, do that. Focus on one thing at a time. If you want to do an email subscribers campaign, do that. If you want to do a book sales campaign, do that. Don't try to combine campaigns. It'll make targeting your audience much harder. Um, if you want to stick to organic on paid posts, that's okay too. Just remember that now is the time to stay engaged. You don't need to be posting on the same frequency that you were when you were actively trying to build up your platform, but you know, don't com completely disappear either. People still want to know that you're here, that you're paying attention, that you're still part of the community. Remember that most social media users don't really actively unfollow accounts unless they're provoked to. So that in inactivity isn't necessarily going to lose you followers, but it will probably cause your followers to disengage with you a little bit. And you don't want to do that. So find a rhythm and a strategy that works for you and maintain it. You are building up your brand brick by brick. And if you keep on building, you're going to have a sturdy community of fans and followers before you know it. And that's only three minutes over, so I think I did okay. You did great. Yes, everyone did great. Thank you guys for sticking out with us a little bit longer. Uh, Lauren, I, I saw one question come through, um, and I promise you guys will let you, well, you know, you can leave whenever you want. We're all adults here, but we're going to wrap this up pretty soon. Um, one question for you, Lauren, that I saw come in. How do you find the hashtags uh, that are appropriate for you and your audience? That's that a great question. Um, you know, and it'll, it will vary by audience. Uh, so there isn't really a clear cut answer to it. The best thing that you can do is find other authors that are writing in your community. Um, so if it's, you know, whatever genre that you're writing in or whatever area of interest that you're writing in, identify a couple of other authors that are also writing in that community and check out uh, some of the content that they've shared and see what hashtags they've used. You're going to have to do, it's going to take a little bit of digging, uh, but, you know, it's good. That is a good general thing to do anyway. You want to be keeping engaged with the authors that are publishing in your community. So, I, yes, Kitty, that's a great point. Am writing, hashtag am writing is always a great place to start. Um, that's a very broad hashtag that then gets narrowed down further. Uh, it's very big on Twitter. 
So if you're if Twitter is your platform of choice, go check that out. Um, Instagram, uh, check out Bookstagram. You'll see a lot of hashtags there within that larger hashtag. Um, so it's really that's that's the best way to do it is to see what other people are using. Awesome. Thank you. So just a reminder, uh, next week, same bat time, same bat place. We will be doing the second part of the series. So, uh, you know, we talked about building your audience today. And next week we will talk about once you have that audience, you've got your website up, you've got your email going, your social media is on point. How can you turn that into sales? How can you turn your these platforms into your own bookstore and then maximize your revenue from those book sales? Um, so I know that we, you know, it looks like we we did okay with questions. So shout out to Anna. Thank you so much for monitoring that. Um, but I just kind of want to end it here by saying it occurred to me after listening to this presentation that this is a lot of, uh, it's a lot of information. It might seem overwhelming to you. Each one of these pillars we spoke about is going to take time and intention and focus and research and development to get it right. Um, so I hope that no one feels, I hope you guys feel excited and inspired and not overwhelmed. And I hope that no one thinks that, you know, by the end of day to day, you need to be in like double digits with followers and traffic. That is not the case. Um, building an audience is a long game and it's constantly evolving. Um, and what we wanted to do today was going to give you the best practices. And like I said, these pillars for building an audience. So if you you know, take kind of take this information and start to implement it bit by bit and piece by piece. Um, and don't try to go at it, you know, at one time, you know, how do you eat an elephant, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's one bite at a time in case you didn't know. So take it a bite at a time, take it a piece at a time. Um, and then, you know, it's always available to you to tweak it. And as it, as your audience evolved, as your content evolves, these things can too. So um, keep that in mind. We've got some great resources on the blog, on our social media, um, and on our, our YouTube channel as well. That's all at lulu.com. Um, so please, you know, reach out if you have any questions or go there for additional resources. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I hope that you all have a great day. This is going to be available on our YouTube channel. Um, probably by tomorrow. So check it out there if you missed any of it. Um, and we hope to see you all next week for part two of this uh, wonderful little series we're putting together for you. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a great day and we'll see you next week. Bye everybody.